Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. In a world where rugged and reliable matters, Ruger stands strong. Celebrating 75 years of American-made craftsmanship, Ruger continues to set the standard for excellence in firearms. From the iconic 1022 to the American rifle and beyond, each firearm embodies precision engineering and our deep-rooted traditions. Join us in honoring a legacy built on strength, innovation, and the American spirit. Hey, you guys, thank you for tuning into this episode of the Wild and Uncut Podcast. I'm your host, Christy Titus, and I'm here with the one, the only, Mr. J. Allen Smith. Woohoo! Uh, you literally do it all hunt, conservationist, uh, guitar player, musician, actor, author, lawnmower, uh, lawnmower, tractor driver, snake killer. Yeah. Whatever it takes. <laughs> Whatever your wife tells you to do. That's right. That's I'm pretty in. much what you're doing. Yeah, sometimes wash the dishes. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, that's... Cook dinner. Okay. You, you got to do it all to be He's well like rounded. a maid. Merry maid. Yeah. Expensive, but good. <laughs> you get what you pay for. That's right. That's yeah. right. You're the best. Yeah, yeah. Of all the things. Yeah. Of all the... So normally, this is so fun because I, I as a, you know, an attendee of these events often get to see you on stage, don't get to interact with you personally. So I feel like this is a real privilege because I watch you on stage and you are so entertaining and charismatic and I think how in the heck does this guy come up with this stuff because people will often ask me to to speak and I think I have nothing to talk about. And then I watch you and you're like, you get up there and you're like charismatic and you're entertaining and you have it going on. It's so easy for you. And I'm like, what, do, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> like this is so- Well, the difference is see, I'm a born BSer. <laughs> <laughs> and so it just comes naturally, you know, when you, you know, I don't know. It's just, I love doing it. Um, it's really, it, I really like doing it for, you know, SCI and yeah. conservation and, mm-hmm. you know, for a good cause. And, uh, you know, it's a fun deal. And I think the big thing for, like, when you come to the shows and stuff, and thank you for saying those nice things about it, but it's a way of a, it's like with your TV show, right? It's a way to express yourself mm-hmm. artistically, get out of your box and do things that you don't normally get to do. So, Because normally you're washing dishes, so exactly, I get and it. Exactly, driving a tractor and stuff. And one of the things I've tried to do, and, I, and hopefully it's you know, shows in uh, the TV show and things like that, is that I think sometimes people take themselves too seriously in the yeah. hunting industry. And... Uh, especially when it comes to big game hunting and attending the conventions and things like that, that my goal has been to try and bring, you know, some levity and yeah. some enjoyment to it. And even for the award ceremony, which we do on Thursday nights at the convention, uh, me and Nick and Jim Shockey, it's, it's always a blast because you're really, while you're giving awards, you're also sometimes poking fun at them yeah. or at yourselves or others that are on the stage with us. So it's made it a lot of fun to lighten things up and mm-hmm. not be too serious about, you know, me, 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 and whoa, look what I did this last year, or, you know, I got this award or all those things. It's great to get awards, but you gotta remember that it's- It's also supposed to be fun. It's just hunting. Yeah, and I really enjoyed this year when Eva got on stage at SCI and she was talking about if you bought her um, access to your hunt in Maui, you would get to see her in a bikini and, and, and it's a much better sight than her dad in one. And um, I have been following Jim on social media and there have been some photos surfacing of him in a pink, a somewhat speedo type device. I don't know what's going on in that area, but. Um. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's got a lot of shtick about that. And just for the record, I can guarantee you that there will never be a social media post where Alan Smith is in a speedo. 
<laughs> I've or got Christy one. Titus, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. No bikini shots, but uh, yeah, but you know, Jim's a brave soul. He is. You know, for, I mean, he puts himself out there and if he thinks he can, he's macho enough to wear a pink Speedo, go for it, brother. Yeah, yeah you know, you guys have a good time and it's definitely, <laughs> like you said, it does bring the room down to a different place and it's a welcomed space because sometimes it gets very monotonous. So it's a, it's a yeah. good break in the monotony. There's some speakers that get a little long-winded. Yeah. But now we're working on it, but I really like the format though. Speaking of the conventions, don't you just love being in Nashville? Yes. I mean, SCI moving to Nashville it's is- It's the greatest thing ever. Oh, it's so much fun. Yeah. There's so much to do. And plus I like the whole, uh, the room that the mm -hmm. dinners are in now and the bread events, you know, where, oh, they, the bread is where they have that dinner as well. So I think that that whole move and getting so many more people to come to the convention yeah. now because it's closer for a lot of people than yeah. going to Vegas and places in like that. In Nashville, everybody has fun in Nashville. Every bar or restaurant you go to has live entertainment and the music there is like all of these unfound geniuses in music. And as you know, there's a lot of people with talent, yourself included, uh, that are musicians and you know you'll heck just 15 years ago Chris Stapleton was playing downtown in a bar yeah. right like think about that like now you pay how much for a ticket to go watch his show yeah <laughs> uh, no I literally when I uh, we usually go a couple days before the convention mm -hmm. then stay a couple days after because mm -hmm. we're working the whole time yeah. and you can't really go out to the places but Every time I go there and I sit in one of those bars and watch, you know, some guy that's playing in a little dive place mm -hmm. and you go, I'm never playing my guitar again. Yeah. That guy is so good, so good and he's playing in this place, yeah. you know, for what, $100 or something if he's lucky or maybe he's playing for tips. But mm -hmm. it's great though and live music is, you know, oh, so it's, wonderful. It's, it, and, and music really is, is the gateway to a memory and, and an experience and, and so is food. So that's what the other thing I like about Nashville is really good food down there. Lots of good food, especially, you know, even at one in the morning, there's <laughs> lots of good dining options. So um, Nashville's been a fun location. I think all the members have enjoyed it and it's become just this destination that, man, we can't, they can't build enough hotel rooms to hold us in Nashville right now. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. And if you, and if people haven't signed up yet, you better get signed up. Yeah. Because the, the sellouts for, I mean, I don't even know how many rooms are left, but I know most of the Omni and the Omni some of the other, out. Yeah, the ones that are yeah. connected to yeah. it are already gone and we're still six months out, so. Yeah. And and we're roaring into town again and, and it's gonna be another incredible year. And, you know, from a fundraising perspective and also from an entertainment value, I mean, the, the location is fantastic. And actually now we're sitting in San Antonio, SCI just brought their headquarters from Tucson, Arizona, here to San Antonio, to the great state of Texas. And we still have an office in Washington, DC, and that's what we're here kind of celebrating now is um, SCI's growth. And I know you have been, um, your hunting career is tremendous. And you know, obviously we'll, we'll talk about that, but in addition to being a hunter, your career in conservation is, is, is incredible. What you have given back every year to SEI and other organizations is is huge. I mean, um, it's not that you know, you're know you taking, you're always giving, and whether it's your entertainment or your your time, your treasure, all of these things, right? You've just given so cash. much. Cash, they love cash. Well, everybody likes money. Yeah. Um, I could use some. So oh, okay. if you're well, looking for a charity. Yeah, a donation. <laughs> You need a new, a new mule. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. No, I'm actually cut off from acquisition of livestock. No more buying point. horses no. or mules. I'm out. I have my hands full. Yeah, so. I, uh, you know, back on the subject of SCI and, and being here in San Antonio, which is great, I think it's one of their best moves. What I really like about what SCI is doing right now is that they're making moves with the management that they have in place, mm -hmm. making great decisions that are fiscally responsible. Yes. You know, this is a move that's not only good for the organization from a location, right? Texas is a good yeah. spot to be and to have a headquarters and centrally located in the U.S., but also it makes financial sense. Mm -hmm. And for those of us that are members, we want to see that our dollars are being spent wisely. Mm -hmm. And the direction they're going right now, I think, is uh, incredible and that they're doing those kinds of right moves mm -hmm. that it encourages people to donate, mm -hmm. right? You know that your money's gonna, your money's not being wasted on overhead, 
it's being used for the mission of hunters' mm -hmm. rights and conservation, and uh, and also it's just not international. You know, SCI is doing so much for North American, yeah. Canadian, and Mexican, and, mm -hmm. and U.S. hunters and hunters' rights and things like that. That you know, it, it makes it you feel a lot better about when you yeah. are making contributions, whether that is time and. And that's the other great thing about SCI too, is it's not about money necessarily, it's about giving your time. Mm -hmm. You know, especially at the chapter level where people spend all that time and energy for free and raising money and, you know, having a great event for their chapter every year. So it's... Uh, well, there's 150 chapters around the country right now, roughly, give or take. Um, and, you know, what a lot of people don't realize with a lot of fundraisers and NGOs is, you know, predominantly the money goes to corporate. SCI has kind of a different structure. So of each chapter that's local's largest fundraiser, only 30% goes to corporate. The other 70% stays local. So if you have community projects or outreach programs or, you know, any type of uh, humanitarian educational outreach projects for, you know, fence removal, water projects. If you need funding, you can actually reach out to those local chapters and help fuel the change that you need to see in your own community. And that's, you know, in addition to what they're doing on a global scale and legislative scale with, you know, having a headquarters in Washington, D.C. and a whole law firm. And when SCI rebranded from the Lion and Shield, I think, logo was roughly 20 years ago, I think, mm -hmm. and they went to the to the tagline SCI First for Hunters. It was a much needed change because the organization is so misunderstood. Um, and people think, well, they send all their money to the continent of Africa and they're not, they're not doing anything locally. And that's the farthest thing from the truth because they're one of the only NGOs that has a legal team in Washington, D.C. that's keeping the thumb on the pulse of what's going on with different lobbyists either for or against us. And, and they're really fighting the front lines to ensure that we have the right to hunt and fish. And um, in that, that battle is lost heavily and predominantly, not only in the court of public opinion, but in our legal courtrooms as well. And, and SCI is, is just, the I man they're on the front lines. Yeah, and, and we've had some great victories lately. Yeah. You know, black bear hunting op opening up again. Louisiana. Yep, and um, you know, state by state, we're seeing you know, the hands-on changes, mm -hmm. just like you're saying, at the local level. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it is for everybody, you know, it's not a, you know, as you say, the, the term safari, mm -hmm. it ha has that connotation mm -hmm. of Africa, but it's, it's really not. It's about all over the world That's doing right. stuff. And so yeah. it's- And you have been all over the world. I've been lucky. I've gotten to shoot a lot of stuff. Yeah, a lot of adventures. Like, I would love to live like a third of the adventures that you have lived. <laughs> Like, well, I'll tell you the good ones. Yeah. And then there's the bad ones, but Ooh. yeah, it's, uh, no, it's been fun. We got to, you know, I, I really enjoy the Africa's probably number one. I like shooting Cape Buffalo. That's yeah. kind of my, still on my list. My Mozambique is on my list. Okay. Be careful. Cause once you get one, you're going to be hooked. Yeah. You know, funny story about talking about Cape Buffalo and your first one. I went to uh, Africa the first time to Zimbabwe, saved up my money. I was about 35-ish, something like that. And uh, so I'd saved and saved and saved. And the old Kleinberger taxidermy studio mm -hmm. sent me over. They had a booking agency also and got over there and, of course, spent more than I was planning of course. on and had to you know, wire the guy money back when I got back. Uh, but I shot a Cape Buffalo on the trip and a kudu and some other stuff. Uh, mainly little things because they were cheap. Yeah. You know, the guy said, do you want a clip springer? And I go, I don't know what's a clip springer. I never even heard of one. Yeah. You know, I knew what a kudu was and a Cape Buffalo and a leopard. And he says, it's that thing right there on that rock. I said, how much are they? He said, 300 bucks. Boom. <laughs> You're like, yes, I do. Yeah. For 300 bucks. I want, you know, I'll have yeah. another one. So, uh, but what it did was by going on that first trip, it was strange that it literally changed my life to where on the trip home, mm -hmm. I had a yellow notepad <clears throat> and I had to figure out how to make enough money to go back that I could go back. And it changed my business life. It changed uh, everything. And my business grew because of that yeah. and setting goals. And it, my goal was originally to go once every two years mm -hmm. hunting, you mm -hmm. know, overseas. And so then it turned into hunting 
you know, 257 days a year kind of a thing. So, but. so it went from a passion to an obsession. Yeah, vice, some yeah, people would yeah, call yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Addiction. Yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. As long as you're not endangering yourself or your friends or family, you're fine. Yeah. You don't need treatment. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jim Allen <laughs> Smith and I'm addicted to hunting. <laughs> But you have literally, so you don't just hunt Africa, you've actually also got a slam of sheep. So you are also a very accredited mountain hunter. Yeah, uh, a lot of the Asian sheep and uh, the, you know, the Ovis ones mm -hmm. that they have in their organization. And uh, Central Asia is its own experience, mm -hmm. you know, for the Marco Polos and the Argalis and things like that. Uh, I've been to Pakistan nine times. It's it's its own experience, you know. It's very different, yeah. and uh, the people there are really nice. I mean, I got to sure. say that, you know, yeah. you know, people say, "Well, are you afraid of the Taliban and stuff like that?" And no, because you're with them. Yeah. You know, they're the guys that have the area, and yeah. and you know, that's just their form of government or whatever. Not saying it's right, but I mean, it's it is what it is, and you go there. But the other thing too, though, about the, those areas, like especially an example with Pakistan, say the Markor which was endangered and almost extinct. Mm -hmm. They have a breeding program in Texas now that's helping replenish those wild Exactly, uh, and, and even in the wild, they're bringing them back because they put a price on their head. Mm -hmm. And now the locals, rather than shooting one for lunch, they're waiting for the next American that's gonna come over and pay them to take one of those markors. And I literally sat there at the end of my hunt and watched the government official dole out $40,000 to the local village, wow. to the chief. Because you know you hear about conservation, mm -hmm. you think, well, yeah, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, or does it just go in somebody's pocket, you know, in the city? It went there. I was back the next year to the same area for other species, and they had built a school wow. that girls could go to, because they the girls weren't going to school. Um, they had a little clinic where they had a full-time uh, doctor, nurse, uh, lady that was there. So it you know, because of that money. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there's no way that they there's can no do that kind of stuff. And $40,000 to a small village in Pakistan is, Everything. you know, winning the lottery. Yeah. Never mind four guys <clears throat> going there in one year for the few permits that are there. So it really is nice to see hands on, mm -hmm. you know, that what we do as hunters is, is worthwhile. And it's a global, it's become a global effort. I mean, in, in, being in Texas, and Texas Trophy Hunters is also part of SCI and in part of all of this is, you know, ensuring that we have a place to be stewards of these wild populations that we can keep them solid breeding programs and, and actually you have these countries that are now buying um, these wildlife species from places in Texas and importing them or re-exporting I should say um, and they're sh sharing semen and genetics and um, this is h conservation through hunting completely and, and I mean these, some of these imperiled species wouldn't exist without hunters. Sable is another one you know you take the sable yeah. in, in South Africa 20 years ago they were one of the most rare antelope species and now they're very prolific because the value of them through hunting created an opportunity where people were like, okay, let's let's encourage the the, the growth of the species and, and invested a lot of money into ensuring that they had a bright future. Mm -hmm. It's incredible to watch all of this happen, and I <clears throat> I can't imagine being in some of these countries and seeing the effects the way you have. Um, mm -hmm. You hear about it, you understand it, but watching it. Um, and then watching it go from handing over money to the next year being a school. Yeah. Um, because there's so much red tape in government, and money gets lost so easily, but you're actually seeing it go to work on the ground, which is yeah. tremendous. And even taking that same subject to the level where, uh, in Tanzania as an example, Adam Clements has put a program together with SCI where we're darting lions now. Mm -hmm. and. The idea, and this is wild lions out in Moyawasi area yeah. in western Tanzania, and the problem that they've been having real quick is that the male lions at a certain age are disappearing from the area, and they don't know where they're going. There's no poaching of lions. I mean, you'll get a little bit of it with uh, uh, if they kill cattle, if they get outside of the hunting areas, and they you know they get run into trouble when that happens. But we don't know what's going on with them because they'll know the lions. You know, each mm -hmm. lion is pretty unique. You mm -hmm. know, when you see a lion, you know that that's Bob and that's Dave and mm -hmm. that's Joe over there. The yeah. three lions. And uh, 
So there's another example, but all of that is being funded by hunters. So the Hunter Legacy Fund uh, put $400,000 into it, and then we've been auctioning off permits mm -hmm. that someone could go and dart the lion, put a collar on it, you know, as a conservation measure. Um, we just had Libby Gear on, um, the Young Hunter Award recipient la from last year. Yeah, great. And she did um, a fundraising effort with John Banovich, and she helped raise the money to actually pay for those collars that went on that program. Yep. And she's just a young, I mean, she was 15 years old at the time. And you, you, I mean, to me, it's incomprehensible to some degree of like this 15 year old young girl that's like, hey, let's raise money and fund a conservation project like you're speaking of. And yeah. um, that's where, you know, being a leader is so important and when you see a need to actually find a way to fill a need. And there's so much need out there. Um, for all these programs to to help conserve and ensure this next generation of these imperiled species. Yeah, no, it's up to us because it's you know, if hunters don't step up and take care of these things, all these other NGOs and you know, tourism is a big part of African, yeah. especially African wildlife, but it brings nothing uh, no. to the table compared to what the permits and that for hunting do and setting those areas aside. But uh, I was over in um, South Africa during the peak of COVID. Um, and nobody was traveling, so it was pretty unique. You know, you'd get on a United flight and you're the only one apart from maybe 10 people on a flight because everybody's terrified. And South Africa never shut its border down. So I was like, hey, let's go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're go people probably think I'm crazy. You went to South Africa during COVID, but yes, I did. And I got COVID while I was there. <laughs> um, and, but you know, we actually took meat to a local orphanage and those kids hadn't had fresh meat in months yeah. because hunters weren't coming. And, and you talk about a school or an orphanage in, in how hunting directly impacts those kids' lives. You know, they'd been eating ramen noodles and Lord knows what else. Well, yeah. they have kind of like a, a grit that they eat um, in those cultures a lot. And um, it's very similar to a grit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we showed up with meat, it was the, the, the look on those kids' faces. They, they were just so grateful. Um, all of the resources, you know, people look at hunting and they say trophy hunting and there's just such negative connotation where it's really selective harvest and nothing is wasted. Everything is given back and has a place and a purpose and um, without the money that goes into us being in those places, the whole thing collapses. There's no funding. Yeah. No, it's, it's really hard to explain that. That's one of the cool parts about it when you see that. Yeah. 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 The kids. I mean, yeah. And nothing goes to waste. You know, that's the other part that there's some people think even in Africa or other places that, oh, you know, you just trophy hunting. And I've, I've never been on a hunt anywhere that the meat, everything's utilized, everything. especially I, in, in uh, Asia and Africa, every part of the guts and everything is. Used. I was going to say yeah. that even the intestines are, are they, they keep those for, for casing. Yeah. Yeah. Or making tripe out of it or yeah. what? Yeah. But yeah. skull pikeys. You have been to South Africa. Oh, I can't stand the smell of a skull pikey. <laughs> so for those of you that are watching, you don't know what a skull pikey is. They take a chunk of the intestine and then they mush together like liver and other organs, which I'm a huge fan of kidney. Mm -hmm. I am not a liver fan. Mm -hmm. um, and they, I don't know, they make some kind of meat mixture and then they shove it into the intestines and they make this little bite and they call it a skull pikey. And when it's cooked, I can smell the liver. I cannot handle it. I cannot eat that. But there is a lot of people that absolutely love school bikies. Don't look for it to be sold at McDonald's. It is soon. not. It, well, it could be in a chicken nugget. Let's be honest, <laughs> because nobody knows what the pink slime is. That is a chicken nugget. Let's Good be, point. It's true. Yeah, it's true. That might I mean, be what it is. It is. It's this. It's that version. <laughs> it's the African version, uh, like a traditional version of the chicken nugget. It's the original chicken nugget. Speaking of McDonald's, I was. Uh, I built this house and my daughter was four at the time and it had a small room on the side of it, you know, that I had some trophies in, some deer heads and I got some cougar or something in there. And uh, so my wife had said, hey, you know, before you take Nicole in there, you should, you know, really get with her and explain, you know, that why there's dead animals in there kind of a thing. So. I took her in and we sat on the stairs and she looked around. She was like, wow, this is really cool and blah, blah, blah. And 
She said, what's that? And I said, oh, that's a deer. And what's that? Oh, that's an elk. And she says, huh? And she goes, well, why did you shoot him? And I thought, uh-oh. Here, here, <laughs> here, here comes the million dollar <laughs> question. And I said, well, you know, we go hunting for them and then we eat the meat from them. And she said, meat? What's meat? Like, you know, she's that age where yeah. she kind of knows what you're talking about. And I said, meat, you know, like when we go to McDonald's and you get a hamburger, right? She says, yeah. And I go, inside there, the brown stuff, that's the meat that's in there. And she goes, oh, yeah. And she looks around the room and she goes, so which one is French fries? <laughs> <laughs> I thought, okay. My conservation message is done for the day. Yeah, yeah. you're failing actually. Yeah. Is what it, that, yeah. You just realized in that moment, I I'm missed not, my point. I yeah. am not doing my job here. <laughs> yeah. That is so funny. Yeah, French fries. Well, those are my favorite food, actually. French fries are. There's not a French fry or a potato that I've found that I don't love. So I'm an equal. Do you do it like once a month? Like you pamper yourself and. I, I try to avoid them. Because you're not eating them daily. No, oh, no, 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 no. But if you truffle any french fry, I'm in, uh -huh. 100%. I, I can't say no. Usually what I do is when I've been on the road for three weeks, I'll make a swing through McDonald's and get the french, french fries. fries. Just for the fries. Yeah, just, you know, because yeah. you haven't had any for yeah. a while, and then I don't have them for a couple months or a month or, yeah. or you know, well, maybe three weeks later. But anyhow, um, yeah, they're pretty good. In the heart of the wilderness, every step counts. No matter where or what you're hunting, Onyx Hunt Elite has you covered in the U.S. and Canada with offline capability, land ownership, 3D mapping, and you can even access specialty courses, hunt research tools, and elite-specific features. No matter where you pursue the wild, adventure is assured when you upgrade to Elite for the ultimate hunting experience. There are a lot of Americans that understand the value of hunting, but we all know that right now, national support of hunting is extremely volatile. It seems that with every passing day, our voice is diminished and the court of public opinion is not effectively hearing our side. We need advocates working on our behalf in Washington, D.C. to defend our freedom to hunt. And thankfully, when we need it the most, we have that advocate in Safari Club International. SCI's world headquarters are located in Washington, D.C., just blocks from the United States Capitol, which means that SCI is on the ground with our congressional leaders and federal agencies on our behalf, on behalf of the hunting community. SCI has an active political presence in all 50 states through their extensive chapter network and government affairs staff. If you have ever wondered why you should be a member of SCI, you shouldn't wonder anymore. Join us in the fight to defend hunting. Go to safariclub.org to learn more. So what you've hunted, you know, you know so many world hunting accomplishments. What is one hunt that you haven't done that you want to do still? Or that you want to repeat? I would be okay with a repeat. Um, I haven't done the uh, Markor in Tajikistan. Okay. So I'm going to go do that this December. Okay. And really excited about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of ran out of Asian animals. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, this is one that's never been open till a couple of years ago. Yeah. So that's Talk about the politics behind that a little bit, if you would. Yeah, it's they've been there, and there's uh, the numbers have grown because of conservation, and uh, the local people had a situation where they same thing, right? They said, "Look, if you leave them alone and let them grow, we'll be able to get permits to go mm -hmm. in there." Well, 20 years later, after all the politics with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife mm -hmm. and the and the Tajikistan government and that. They finally got some export permits, and CITES, the organization that controls all that stuff, they issued the permits. And now what Tajikistan does, it's a, a unique conservation program. Each village, if you can imagine a, a mountain range, mm -hmm. each village that's based at the river owns this drainage. many acres, this drainage of this mountain. <clears throat> so they get two permits for their area. 
their neighbors get two permits. The next neighbor may get four permits because he's got a bigger area. So each village is responsible for their own markors. And wildlife management practices. Yep, and making sure that they don't overgraze it, making sure that they are only taking you know, high quality old males that are finished breeding. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a great program and they're shooting tremendous uh, markors in there mm -hmm. right now. So you gotta rob a bank before you go. Well, 100%, yes. Um, yeah. Or, you know, win the lottery, so. I'd have to save for my lifetime, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, you know, you gotta have one. You only live once. That's right, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but no, looking forward to that. Um, I, I like mountain hunting a lot. Yeah. Uh, I'm lucky that I was, you know. And you're fit, I'm built you're a for fit it. guy. And, and, you know, when you're, it's easy to do it when you're, you know, my size, not, you know, yeah. I'd hate to be trying to do it if I was a big guy. Yeah. 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 The smaller Eat guys, French fries. the smaller guys do much better on the mountain. Like if you go on a sheep hunt, my experience is like 130, 140 pound guys do so much better than the 200 pound guys on the mountain, especially they're carrying the same weight, <laughs> but they yeah. like, they got as much on their tall. back as they weigh. Yeah. Like yeah. literally almost like the half buggers. their body weight. Yeah. But, uh, no, it's fun. I like the mountains. I like the experience of it. And I like the, I used to live in Alaska for years and got to, you know, hunt on our own up there, mm -hmm. which was a great learning curve. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I like that whole concept of tents. And I mean, I love safari. Don't get me yeah, wrong. For sure. But the other extreme of, uh, you know, tenting or bear hunting, I was on Unimac Island last year for 16 days in a tent and brown bear. Yep. And you had five days of couldn't leave the tent because mm -hmm. the wind was blowing so hard and you know, the rain and all that. So did you get a brown bear? I did not. Mm -hmm. I'm one of the few that didn't. Sh now I could have shot lots of bears, Yeah. but not the right one. You know, Unimac Island's the home of the monsters. Yeah. I put in for 37 years yeah. and I finally got drawn. Yeah. And, uh, we had one at hundred yards. I was with uh, Justin Dubai, the, you know, one of the best brown bear guides on earth. Uh, him and I had a brown bear charge about 10 years ago that, you know, he, he stood his ground, which was pretty cool. So I like hunting with him, but I hired him to guide me with the specific instructions that you're to tell me not to shoot. Yeah. Okay. Cause I'll shoot, Yeah. but you need to tell me that one's not big enough. Yeah. Cause when they, you know, when you get yeah. to see them in close, and it's an in, in, impressive and intimidating animal, I can only imagine. Unbelievable, you know. And the difference, too, between, sometimes people forget, a nine-foot brown bear versus a true 10, 10-foot-6 10 brown bear is a substantial, yeah. you know, when you use that as a measurement. It's a different bear. It's a It's much, not a foot. No. <laughs> it's not 12 inches. It's no, it's 300 hundreds pounds. Hundreds of pounds. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. know, or something like that. And so, but we looked at him, and so... We sat on a beached whale for 16 days, and the right one never came. But mm -hmm. and it was a great experience, and you know it's nice to be out there doing it. But oh, you know, I don't regret it. You know, I don't want to just shoot one to. No. I don't need another it's brown about, bear. About being selectively harvesting. Also, it goes back into taking what the right animal is at the right time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, but yeah, I think that uh, I'll tell you the hunt I would never do again is polar bear. That's one I, I don't want to ever do. Yeah, it sounds absolutely miserable. Yeah, I did it when, you know, a long time ago. And it was with dog team, you know, you go yeah. out with the dogs and you stay in a pup tent with a Coleman stove and... Skins on the floor, on the, uh, on the ground. Yep, uh, two caribou skins mm -hmm. and three of us in a two-man pup tent and they're both smoking the whole time. Oof. And, you know, they've got a t-shirt and a Kmart windbreaker on, and I look like the Michelin man. I got so much stuff on. I never took my clothes off. No. Even, not my boots, not my parka, not my face mask for the whole time. Really? Yeah. It was that cold? Yeah. It, it averaged around 22 to th minus, minus 22 to minus 32. And the they were time. in a t-shirt in the tent. They don't even care. You know, they're in a, their sleeping bag. You wouldn't sleep in a Wyoming night in it. I would die. Yeah. Yeah. Like I say, I got more stuff on and, but, uh, no, it was just, it, it's, it's a very, very difficult hunt mm -hmm. and not fun at all. Yeah. Um, I mean, I got some great stories from well, it for and, sure. all that, and I got for a sure. bear, but, uh, it's mm -hmm. not one that you go, wow, 
I can't wait to, to go do that yeah, again. Woo, that was a blast. Yeah. No, it was. Uh, I know one other hunter, and he told me the same thing. Uh, Jim Craig, you probably know yep, Jim. Yeah. And Jim said, that was a hard hunt, miserable hunt. Yeah, and now I think the gear is a little better. Yeah, you know, and they and, use snowmobiles now. Yeah, and people are able to, uh, the, the outfitters themselves have, the, have got the local people geared up with the right stuff yeah. where these guys, it's just another day for them. They're yeah. just like, yeah, come on, we're going hunting. Yeah. Wait a minute, where's the heater for the tent? Where's yeah. the, you know, all your meals are frozen because there's no way to keep it from freezing at that temperature. Yeah. So they pull out a frozen pork chop, a frozen pack of peas, put them all in a frying pan with seal oil because the seal oil doesn't freeze yeah. and everything tastes like seal oil. And that's what the dogs eat too, is seal lard and yeah. And fox carcasses and mm -hmm. yeah, it was a, uh, but yeah, anyhow, that's one to, but hey, I encourage anybody who wants to go get a polar bear. Go do go it. Go do it, woo. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> but I warned you. I, yeah, that's one. And then there's some people that have been going muskox hunting. And that just seems a little bit anticlimactic for me as well. I'm like, well, I don't know. I really haven't had the desire for muskox. It doesn't seem that intoxicating to me as a hunt. Do the Greenland one. Is it good? Yeah, and uh, you and you do it before it snows. Okay. Yeah, and I, I want to say it's like a July thing, if I remember right. All right. But uh, that's a fun trip. Is it? Yeah, okay. and you get to see a lot of stuff. You can also get a caribou. Okay. Uh, foxes, huge hares. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a neat experience, but it's, I've done them both. I've done the yeah. 30 below one too. And there again, the fun factor is not good. I did a, a deer hunt in Nebraska and it was 30 below and my friend's house was there. <laughs> so it was great because we'd go into her house. Our camera batteries lasted a half an hour. Um, so I don't even know from a battery management perspective, how you'd even document something. I don't think you can. No, I, I mean, even we weren't filming, but I had cameras Yeah. and you just keep the Everything batteries you. inside, you know, against your skin just to keep them warm and then you pull them out, but you couldn't have them out for five minutes and they just, they're completely dead. Yeah. So, and it wouldn't come back. No. It just burns them out. They just don't like that cold, but no. And we run across that on some of our mountain trips too, mm -hmm. you know, where you have no chance to recharge them. Mm -hmm. And when it gets cold in some of those areas, we had a show we did for the Himalayan Ibex in Pakistan. And while it wasn't real snowy, it was rarely above freezing and it was a real pain. The biggest thing, as you know, is you just didn't run a lot of B-roll. No. You know, you're saving it for the kill the shot moment. and then you film some stuff afterwards. Yeah. Little secret that we do, by the way. Uh, we should everything really is real on telling. TV. I don't yeah, know. yeah, yeah. There's no B-roll. Um, but yeah, it's a real challenge with yeah. the battery life. Are you still producing a show? Yeah, we're still releasing some things. Uh, we're gonna film the Markor hunt. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been on a hiatus though for the last couple of years and um, taken a break mm -hmm. uh, for lack of a term. And we had a lot of stuff in the can. Mm -hmm. So we've been releasing some uh, footage, but uh, yeah, kind of, you know, and coming into COVID was good timing to, you know, take the break and you couldn't really go anywhere other than well, you a few could. places. Yeah. You could. I went yeah. to Tanzania actually yeah. during it. I love the way the Tanzanians put it. I said, you guys aren't concerned about COVID down here. And they go, we have a lot worse things to worry about than COVID. That's right. They did. <laughs> uh, we actually got pulled over at like a checkpoint when we left the Johannesburg airport, which is rather common by the police. And the guy is screaming at me, aren't you afraid of Delta? And he's screaming at me and I'm like, don't they have that around the whole world? Like, it's not special for you. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm not afraid because I'm going to keep living. And, um, and we did, you know, we, 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 but I was, I remember I, <laughs> I did get COVID and I was, I had this elephant uh, drinking from the water and I'm sitting in a blind and it's 20 yards from me. And I was so sick. I couldn't stay awake. I was like, <laughs> like there is an elephant. <laughs> a giant bull elephant 20 yards from me and I can't stay awake. Like that's when you know you're sick. You probably yeah. shouldn't be hunting, but I still hunted. And you know, we had a great trip because like you're there. I'm not staying inside just because I'm sick. Uh, I, had the, I had the opposite. I got it three times. And the only reason I knew I had it was because I was trying to get on an airplane and to you go. had to get tested. And I go in, they go, yeah, you got COVID. And I go, no, I don't. I, I don't, I feel fine. Yeah. So each time I would go to another place, and test again yeah. to see if they were wrong because you know sometimes there was yeah. those false 
negatives or what do they call them? And uh, yeah, so I had to cancel three different trips oh, no. because you know I couldn't get on the plane. No? Positive, in uh, but never had a symptom. Never yeah. lost taste. You know, yeah, maybe a little bit of a runny yeah. nose, but it was kind of weird that you know because some people got obviously really sick. Oh, I was very sick. I was like actually this close to going to the hospital. And I actually feel like I was lucky that I got sick there because they gave me medication that I couldn't have gotten here in the US. And the, but then unfortunately we had to extend our trip. <laughs> <laughs> oh bummer. Oh bummer. <laughs> yeah. You know, so that I could fly home. And um, we were supposed to go to Europe and I told my husband, I was like, I am not flying to Europe right now. Like, I always wanna go home, I've been sick. And you know, we had to extend because you have to have recovered for, there's like a 10 day period. So we, we were actually, you know, in country much longer than we had anticipated, which was, it was a beautiful place to be sick. Yeah. The hippos running around and um, very, uh, there's so much, so many intoxicating factors about visiting other continents and countries and. Have you got anything coming up for overseas this year? Uh, not this year. So next year I'm trying to get my gray sheep. Mm -hmm. So next year I'm doing a fan and ram hunt with an outfitter in the Yukon. So awesome. that's my goal next year. And then I have harvested a moose, but I, I will, I will have a permit for a moose in my pocket. And if I, it'll be on a trophy fee. So if I see a moose that I want to harvest, it'll be the, you know, that'll be great. Yeah, it'll be great. And then, um, I'm going to do tar in New Zealand, which I've done once. Um, but I'm going to do that again next spring. Um, but then next on the short list is that Cape Buffalo. So one of these days I'm going to get there. And um, so what, what's the sickest place you've ever been? Sickest? Like, do you get, like, because I've heard people in China that get, like, food poisoning and, like, miserable in their yurts and... Uh, yeah. Anything like that happened to you? Oh, yeah. Um, although I do have to say I kind of got an iron gut, I think, probably from just... You Eating know, horse milk. You eat so much, yeah, yeah bad <laughs> stuff. Um, Curdled horse milk. Yeah, I got sick in the Central African Republic one time, and uh, my buddy Mac Paget was with me, and we flew in there and we landed, and it was kind of a combo of a bunch of stuff, mm -hmm. it turned out. But, uh, you know, the usual culprits of yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. vomiting and diarrhea and stuff like that, but sick, sick. Like, you know, you don't want to get out of bed sick. And of course, when you're in the middle of nowhere, yeah. And it's day one and you already feel like that. Oh. And the, you know, it's a charter plane in and out. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's a, a great hunting place, but there's no services mm -hmm. or anything. And now of course it's closed, unfortunately, but um, we couldn't do anything for the first couple of mm -hmm. days. And of course my buddy and the PH, they're you know, going and doing stuff and coming back and I'm still there and you know, you're gonna live or what? You know, you're not drinking, are you sure? You must be dying. So finally it ran its, its cycle, but you know, I was that far from pulling the trigger and saying, yeah. send the plane, yeah. you know, and so I was just eating. I try and carry a lot of stuff like Cipro and yeah. you know, I kind of got a little medicine. Uh, mm -hmm. And what were you hunting on that trip? That was for Bongo okay. and uh, for Sitatunga. Okay. And uh, what else did they have in there? Oh, the, uh, the buffalo, the uh, forest buffalo mm -hmm. and Central African buffalo. And then they had a lot of the dikers, the, uh, red River Hog, the, uh, there's a red diker in there. What else was in there? It was, but I, I had a really lucky trip. Oh, and, and also there's Lord Darby Eland in uh -huh. there. Very big ones, yeah. Yeah, and so it was, a, it was a very successful trip. I mean, we got everything we went after on the trip, so it did pan out, but, mm -hmm. but that getting like that kind of sick is no fun when you're over there. And, but, but it was kind of like, I'm going to ride it out as long as I can because once you leave, you can't go you're back. Not you know, going you're, back. The guy's going to, you know, you're yeah. done. So, but. Uh, you made it through. Yeah. I got pretty sick in Mongolia one time too, but that was probably from eating stuff. You know, as you're eating it, you're thinking. Oh, I probably should be eating this. This isn't a good idea. There's just something in the there's, back of your brain that is telling you you're going to get ill from this. There, there's something about the smell of this that it's not doesn't right. quite, yeah. It's and then not adding up. Sure as hell about 12 <laughs> hours later. Oh, you know. that is the worst feeling with fish too. Oh. Um, so how many species have you hunted that you would say are not importable anymore or exportable from those countries that you feel especially privileged to have had the opportunity to have the experience that others don't know? The big one would be China. Mm -hmm. When China was open, it was an incredible place to go. Very organized. 
Uh, you could do the blue sheep that was there. Mm -hmm. Now you can do the same blue sheep in Pakistan now, uh, but uh, they also had the uh, white lip deer mm -hmm. that was in there, uh, both of the Takin, the, which is kind of like a musk ox for those of you mm -hmm. who have never seen them. There's the golden one and then the Szechuan uh, Takin. Um, there was uh, several Argali's that are in there that are found nowhere else, like the Gansu Argali. Although I didn't shoot a Gansu Argali, you couldn't export them at the time when I was there. Well, actually, you could. It was open for about a year where you could export them, mm -hmm. and then it closed and never reopened. And I remember I was on the hillside and we were looking for blue sheep, riding these little ponies up, and it's super high, yeah. you know, 15,000 feet Very plus. Very high. Like you didn't spend a day at a base camp probably acclimating. Yep, we did. Yeah. And you had to just sit around for a couple of days before you could you know, go any further. And uh, so all of a sudden this band of these rams have gone to our gullies come over, and they're going, you know, do you want one? There's no interpreter or anything. It was just the local guides. And so I'm going, how much? You know, I'm drawing a dollar sign in the dirt, and they said it was 10,000 US. But this is in uh, like 1990 or something, mm -hmm. something like that. So 10,000 was 10,000. Yeah. And I didn't have to, well, I could have sold something and had 10,000, but right. So I didn't shoot it because I couldn't take it home. It would have been a $10,000 picture. But a week later, <laughs> You're like, I would have had one of the four Gansu Argalis yeah. that were ever killed. Yeah. You know, but anyhow, so I didn't do it. But, um, but China was one of those places that it was such a great experience, yeah. you know, and uh, now, and it'll never, I, I shouldn't say never, but. Highly with the, unlikely. With the political problems and everything else. Yeah. And lots of wildlife. You know, you see You a wouldn't lot. think of, of China. It was a huge country, obviously. So. And see also Tibet, you know, which they called, mm -hmm. when we say we were hunting blue sheep, in China, you were actually hunting in Tibet, the Tibetan blue sheep. Mm -hmm. So I uh, got to see Lhasa Apso and all that stuff. And, uh, or Lhasa. Lhasa, Lhasa Apso, I think, is a dog. That's a dog. <laughs> Named after Lhasa. Yeah. Wherever the, <laughs> the guy, you know, the, They're the, cute and wherever funny. the Dalai Lama's from. Yeah. Went by that place. He hunted the Lhasa Apso in yeah. China. Vicious little. And then she ate, he ate that on the street. Food. Vicious little critter. <laughs> there is a joke about eating dogs in China. Now we know where it comes from. It's the Lhasa Apso. Speaking of which, um, of eating stuff, you know, I've, you mentioned earlier that I've, I'm an author. And yes. uh, so I'm going with a new uh, venue. I've done novels and I've done hunting books, but I thought this time I'm going to do a, a cookbook. So you've done, you, just to clarify for the audience, you have done... What, what I would call like a documentary style of your hunting stories. Yeah. But then you've also gone into some nonfiction or some fiction. fiction. Excuse yeah. me. You got to remember, <laughs> yeah. the hunting books are nonfiction. Non -fiction. The and novels are... And then you've are, gone into fiction now as yeah. well. And now you're doing cooking? Yeah. And so the thought is, I'm going to do a new cookbook and I'm going to do a Vietnamese, Cambodian mm -hmm. kind of fusion. Yeah. And I'm going to call it 101 Ways to Walk Your Dog. <laughs> so. Into my stomach. <laughs> That's right. Um, but uh, yeah, so... That's my latest. That's great. My latest word. <laughs> the Vietnamese Asian fusion spin on dog walking. That's right. Um, you know, I have two dogs, and I don't want to eat either one of them. I, I did during COVID. I found I have the, I had a Maltese. And <laughs> We've I, evolved into talking about eating dogs. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Well, because this is where it goes. But I found this this meme, and it had a little white Maltese, and then it had all of the little cuts of meat kind of spelled out, like the loin and the ham and. And it, it spelled it out in red lines around the little dog. And then the top of it said, in case things get really bad. And I sent it to my mom. And she was like, what is wrong with you? Like, well, you never know. I mean, my dog was little. Can't buy toilet paper. Might have to start eating you, dogs. You might have to eat Zoe. Um, yeah. She was really old, though. You wouldn't probably want to eat her anyway. Yeah. Um, it's not that good. I mean, I've eaten it when I've been overseas over there. But it's... You know, it's an acquired taste. Well, and I'm I'm an advocate for eating anything, really. Um, so horses, my husband's European, mm -hmm. and eating horse is the same as eating beef in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always, you know, when I'm talking about conservation and wildlife management, and I'm, I'm a huge advocate for eating feral horses in the United States. And you would think that some people's 
would want my hair to catch on fire as soon as I say that, but it is, it is actually a very viable food source and it's good food. Um, and you have to do something with management of all wildlife. And so I'm a huge advocate for horse consumption. When I was in Germany this last Christmas, they actually sold donkey sausage at the Christmas market there. And the guy's like, oh, do you want to try it? And I'm like, hmm. I have no issue with people eating it. I just don't want to eat it. I don't need to eat a dog or a donkey. So yeah. good. And I have tried horse meat. I'm not opposed to trying it. I've had it. it you know, they cure it a lot like pastrami though in that lunch meat. It's very yeah. salty and Yeah. Back to this year's hunting. Yeah. Uh, going to Mozambique for the first time. You are. You've never been to Mozambique. Uh, incredibly because there's really nothing unique there. So okay, well, <laughs> when I was out, you know, on the okay. mission trying to collect yeah. stuff, you know, you don't there's nothing that's there yeah, that the, you can't you can find, find in another else. country. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, Mark Haldane and Zambezi, you know, Delta, they've done such a great conservation job and brought the buffalo back mm -hmm. and the lion program that they have with mm -hmm. Cabela's and that, that I'm really excited to get down there and, and you know, go with those guys yeah. and see what their buffalo hunting is like. And they have the swamp buffalo, which is really, I, I really like doing that, you know, where you get out there and sneak in see, on See, that's, I, okay, so I, when I go to hunt Cape Buffalo, it will be in Mozambique. That is the one thing I'm like, hard no. I am not putting my foot and body in the water, mm -hmm. in the swamp. I don't, what is in there? Leeches. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's always a great experience when you. I don't want to do that. That's my one. Can you stay on dry ground? You got like 30 leeches all attached to you. It's life-saving in some cases. Yeah. I don't feel like that's the case. That's yeah, kind of gross. Yeah. How do yeah. you pull them off? You just. I put a match on their head. A match? Yeah. Okay. You know, that makes them let go right so now. So don't get your matches wet. That's, that's right. That, make <laughs> sure your pH smokes. are permanently attached. Yeah, okay. make sure he's a smoker. Um, but you know, Which when all you, the pHs are smokers. You don't have to worry about that. They all smoke. Ain't that the truth. But when you get out there, though, they, they're much calmer because they don't get pressured out there. Yeah. And you can get in close, you know, and use a double and rifle. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a nice way to go. Yeah, that's uh, that's insane. I that's the one thing I said I don't want to get in the water, but I do want to go there because they still have the tent safari camps and they yeah. have wild roaming lions, which you don't want to be in the dark with at night. I get that. Mm -hmm. um, I'll stay in my tent, um, but I definitely want to have that experience just to have that wild. And you can get you can hunt and harvest buffalo in South Africa for a fraction of the cost if you want just kind of that experience, but. Mm -hmm. Mozambique is that, you know, wild. wild. Free range. Yes. And same thing with Inyala, you know, a great place for Inyala, mm -hmm. free range ones, mm -hmm. uh, dikers. Uh, there's a lot of game there. So mm -hmm. I'm looking kudu. forward to it. Yeah, really nice kudu. Mm -hmm. um, Leopard. Something different to do, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it'll be fun. Mm -hmm. New place. Brand new. I'm, I'm on the list. Someday I will be there. Um, but for me, that's one of the reasons I moved to Wyoming as well is because I can do so much hunting from that DIY perspective that I can actually take the money that I would normally be spending to go on outfitted hunts uh, for North American species like mule deer or elk and I can actually just save that money in a little coffer yep and that's kind of my hunting budget if you will and now i can i can allocate other funds into places and you know this year i don't have anything truly remarkable my husband's swedish so we'll hunt roe deer in sweden but that's you know this on his family farm it's like hunting a white-tailed deer here yeah um but i am working on you know that it it will be 26 mm -hmm. or 27. But isn't it fun though getting to go on your like do it yourself and yes. you go and you take your horses or your mules mm -hmm. or you hike in and mm -hmm. all that. I mean, that really is to me, even after all the things that you've done and going to all these different places, it's your chance to, you know, do real yeah. hunting yeah. on your own. And well, and I was with my dad and, you know, I spend all of my free time. Well, I like animals more than people. So I have one friend in Sheridan, pretty much, no offense to the other people of Sheridan, I love you guys, but I don't have a lot of friends. And my husband was gone for two weeks in, in March in Sweden, and I realized I did not see a human because all I do is either work in my office or I'm out at my little, uh, they call it a pasture there, um, with mules. And so hunting Wyoming, it's great because I'm with my best friends, which is my mules that I hang out with every day, and my dad, and, and it's just like being home. It's, it, mm -hmm. you know, I can go hunt and then go home, but then I, I get to dream about these other adventures. And there's so many people out there that are saying, well, I can't afford to do those things. And I am a huge Dave Ramsey follower. Mm -hmm. 
And I was at SCI this year and I listened to a guy just scoff, I can't afford this, I can't afford that. And I was like, did you go to Starbucks today? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I went and got a coffee. And I'm like, hmm, if you gave that up for a year or two, guess what? You can afford. You can go to South Africa. Your priorities are messed up. Yeah. <laughs> and this other guy that was listening is like, I like your philosophy, but it's true. We all have priorities in our spending. You think about how many hundreds of dollars a month you spend eating out instead of eating at home or going to a coffee shop or buying another pair of jeans or shoes you don't really need. Yeah. Um, and you lose focus on a dream because you think it's so out of reach when really the only thing that's out of reach is your lifestyle and lifestyle creep. And if people checked and lived day to day a more humble lifestyle, then you save and you're purposeful. You can go anywhere in the world you want to go. You're right on the money. I mean, it's like I said in the beginning, it's about setting goals yeah. and priorities. Mm -hmm. And when you set a goal and you say, this is what I want to do, it's mm -hmm. amazing how yeah. you will change little things in your life that it, you know, it turns it around and, and all of a sudden you can go because yeah. you set a goal. So. I want to talk really briefly because we're, we're, you know, I could talk about your hunting stories and everything with you for hours because you're absolutely fascinating to me about some of the most proud accomplishments you've done on the conservation side because there are so much you have given to SCI and Graham Slam, Obus Club and the two organizations just to name two that you're notable for your contributions. Can you tell us about our viewers and listeners, a, a, maybe a project or two that you're extremely proud of. Uh, we talked earlier about this, the lion, the lion darting program, mm -hmm. which is you know our latest uh, great project. Uh, we've been funding some other programs with uh, boreholes in different places, water holes, uh, locally, like in uh, Montana, uh, as an example. I had a place in uh, southeast where we set aside nine miles of the Powder River and uh, put an easement on for one mile of the river, mm -hmm. uh, one mile off of the river all the way along it for mm -hmm. the nine miles to set it aside for wildlife and keep the cattle off of it to mm -hmm. try and you know bring the edge back. Mm -hmm. uh, Wild, white tailed turkey habitat, you know. And literally in, yeah. in a year it took off. Yeah. I mean the habitat just grew back yeah. once it, uh, you know, and I'm pro cattle and of have lots yeah. of cattle and love it. Yeah. But um, you know, it's just a way of giving back and protecting that area. Plus it makes for great hunting. You mm -hmm. know, let's not mm -hmm. be too uh, <laughs> holier than thou, but yeah. you know, all of a sudden you had every white tail in the neighborhood living there. Yeah. Um, so I think it's things like that. I mean, I think wetlands protection uh, Yeah, projects. because you live in a flyway. Yeah, we have really good duck hunting and uh, spend a lot of time uh, doing that, you know, enhancing the areas and uh, making sure that we are producing food for the ducks so they stay through the winter um, and nesting habitat mm -hmm. and things like that. So I think those are probably the ones dearest to my heart because mm -hmm. you're hands on doing them. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. we funded a lot of projects worldwide, but you know, the ones you get to see day to day are the ones that are really close to your heart. I agree. Yeah. yeah. There's, and there is so much impact. I think for me, the the experiences I've had with some of the kids in orphanages and schools in Africa, um, be it South Africa or Namibia, I've only been to two countries. So my experience there is very limited, but that has been perspective changing. Mm -hmm. um, when you see kids without shoes and they've never owned shoes and you know, there's all these, these things, you know, SCI with taking blue bags over there and, and being part of that on my trips there has been extremely enriching to my life. But you're right, what you do at home influencing a kid at home, um, especially with where our media is and the public opinion on hunting is on the decline. The work that we do at home is so important so that we can continue to spearhead conservation efforts, continue the right to hunt and fish, and have people understand the value of it in today's society. It is probably the most important. For sure. For us, just because it's here And take well. a kid hunting. Yeah. Even if it's not your kid, take them out. We try and get kids out, you know, mm -hmm. teach them about duck hunting and pheasant hunting and stuff like that for mm -hmm. a starter, mm -hmm. you know. Do you cut their stomachs apart and watch, like have the kids see what they're eating and do that whole deal? Oh yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty fascinating. And, like, and cleaning them and yeah. then cook them up and everything else. Yeah. It's part, of, and it brings it full circle yeah. for them. But I think it's important because, it, you know, we're losing, 
headcount when mm -hmm. it comes to hunters, and especially kids that live in the city that are never going to have the opportunity. Yeah. And there's a lot of kids out there that you know are broken homes. Mm -hmm. uh, dad's not around to take them hunting, or dad never did hunt. Mm -hmm. And even fellow friends, like you know, living in the Northwest and the Seattle area, I live outside of Seattle, just to be clear, but. Uh, you know, take a friend out that's not a hunter, mm -hmm. or take them fishing, mm -hmm. get them out in the outdoors. And I've never taken anybody that doesn't get hooked. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they want to go the first time, you take them out plinking with 22s first, or yeah. pistols, and they've never shot a pistol. And next thing you know, they're buying a gun and a. They going realize to, it's fun. Going on, uh, uh, getting their hunter safety certificate, mm -hmm. and, you know, you've created a new advocate. So that's one of the things I did when I moved to Wyoming, was uh, became a hunter and instructor. And it is really difficult to become a hunter ed instructor in Wyoming. They make it, it's, it's a huge process. Um, but there is such a need for hunter education. I encourage everybody, like, if you can become a hunter ed instructor, please do it because there's such a need locally. And then there, um, Wyoming Game and Fish has a, a subset called uh, Wyoming, where well, the Wildlife Fund is WYLD Life mm -hmm. Fund. And Maria Davidson from SCIF and I, she's the large carnivore manager. She and I just spent last week with kids mentoring them. Half the kids are local from Wyoming that grow up in different, they're not troubled kids, but they're at a higher risk mm -hmm. um, uh, demographic. And then they bring in kids from around the United States. So some kids from, came from New Jersey, some kids came from California and we immerse them for a week in this wild experience. And it's non-hunting, it's fly fishing. I mean, they talk about wildlife conservation principles, it's horseback riding, it's survival. I mean, there's the whole breadth of educational curriculum. And, you know, Wyoming Wildlife Fund is funding that. And they have a boys camp and a girls camp. But it's it's a 100% scholarship program. It is extremely expensive. Um, so I always want to encourage people like find these local programs or subsets in your states because getting these kids that are in or coming from families that are non-hunting, anti-hunting and getting them to a wild place so you can only protect what you love yep. and you only love what you know. And we have to introduce more people to wildlife and wild places because otherwise they're just learning from Sierra Club how bad. Uh, we are as hunters. Yeah, and uh, Disney. And Disney. Oh boy. Yeah. Well, and the, I'm going to tell you, the Prince, it doesn't exist. Okay. Like this whole thing that Disney sold me as a child, I call BS and it's not real. Okay. <laughs> I've never kissed anybody that's been a frog that's turned into anything apart from a frog. <laughs> so there's no hope for us then, I guess. No. And I tried. I had my dad it. brought me this big bullfrog when I was a little kid. And we have pictures of me kissing. This frog did not work. Disney lies. Okay. Yeah. Did you get a wart on your lip from it? No, I oh, never okay. got warts from it. It was a big old frog. And then I turned it loose and my dad was mad because he was going to eat it. And I was like, <laughs> you know, whatever. Save the frog from my dad. <laughs> <laughs> the full circle right there. Yeah, conservationist. Yeah, I was conserving the bullfrogs of, <laughs> of Oregon at the time. Uh, so if people want to read your books, yep. how do they, you have a website. I do go to jallensmith.com okay. and Alan is... A L A I N, okay. the French version, and uh, everything's there. Uh, we've got our shows on YouTube. Okay. Same thing, J. Allen Smith, and uh, we've got I don't know, 150 some shows on there, and uh, some music, and uh, some. We're gonna have a podcast on there. Are you? Yeah, this one. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> I know, but you're you're not launching your own. Podcast. No, 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 yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm leaving that to the pros. Uh, yeah, and then the, he has really high the, <laughs> expectations for this. So the books I'm a are there. Now. Books are there also. There's three novels, and I don't know. I think there's six, two or three. Three novels okay. and six hunting books. Okay. And uh, novels doing great. Thank you to everybody who's buying them. Uh, the the one but has the been one, a the, nov the thing with his books is the money, the proceeds from his books go back to conservation. Yeah. So it is, you're writing these books, you're sharing these stories, you're sharing these experiences, and it's not in a self-ish uh, capacity. You want to share your journey, but you're also giving back in the process. So that's something... Um, We've raised over $350,000 from yeah. book sales, so it's been it's incredible. great. And thank you to everybody that's yeah. bought them, and yeah. it's gone to the all the organizations and so they make a great gift and if nothing else you can just put them in your bathroom and if somebody's bored for a long time in there and and for those of you guys that you know <laughs> you say well i don't really read that much 
you have to look at my hunting books like this. A great guy once told me, you know, your hunting books are kind of like Playboy. You know, the pictures are a lot better than the words. <laughs> so there's some good photos, some good hunting photos in there. Yeah, so, the places yeah. you've seen through the through your eyes and the optic of a camera is, um, I'm sure it's pretty incredible. So you guys, I encourage you all to check out what Alan, I'm allowed to call him Alan sure. now, because we're now friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> encourage you to follow along with what he's doing um, again if you have an opportunity to come to an event say hi rib him a little um, and and just have a good time come have a good time with us at convention because that's what we're all here to have a good time and conserve what we love and uh, thank you all for tuning into this episode and thank you for joining me here. thanks for having me yeah, this has been great it's my pleasure it's, yeah, I, yeah we let's get go hunt somewhere well now I'm in yeah yeah, maybe yeah. you need to hold off on your Mozambique trip another year and I'll go with you. <laughs> no. I'll bring a cameraman, maybe you can come on this one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We're making plans already, you guys. Mm, Stay tuned. Cameraman's nodding, yes. He's, he's back there like, I'm yes, in. I'm in. <laughs> Thank you guys for tuning Thank in. Thank you. When conditions get tough on a mountain hunt, your gear must be tougher. Making every opportunity count means selecting equipment that will not fail. Any condition, anywhere, Hornady Outfitter ammunition is designed to perform. Available in a wide range of cartridges from 243 to 375 Ruger. When you're looking for a hard hitting, deep penetrating bullet and cartridge that performs in the most rugged environments, look no further than Hornady Outfitter ammunition. Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.